Thanks for joining us. Um, I'm Bruce. I'm a business advisor here with the Small Business Development Center at Columbus State Community College. And you have joined us for uh, our newest installment in our business clinic series, um, Intellectual Property and You, Developing Your Brand Strategy. Um, if you have questions while we're going through the evening um, or afternoon or morning, if you're attending this live, rather, um, uh, hold on to your questions until the end of the program. That way, we are certain we have time to get through everything. Um, our uh, speakers this evening are Allison Mortinger and Steve Mortinger. Um, both are uh, licensed attorneys, uh, licensed to practice in Ohio and New York. Um, Allison holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Operations Research and Industrial Engineering from Cornell and a law degree from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Uh, she has over 25 years uh, experience. And Steve is um, graduated from Denison University and received his law degree, law degree from the Ohio State uh, Law School, uh, Moritz Law School rather. Um, and he has over 34 years um, experience. Um, and with that, I will turn uh, everything over to Steve and Allison. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Bruce. All right, let me make sure I've got this. I, can you see this uh, slides okay? Yes. Good, okay. So uh, just start, hello everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Steve Mortinger, as Bruce said. I'm a founder and managing partner in the Mortinger and Mortinger Law Firm. We've just started our operations here in Columbus after doing decades of in-house IP legal and corporate legal work. I wanna thank Bruce and the Ohio Small Business Development Center for inviting us to talk today. Allison and I have been working with Bruce as we went through our own journey to start a business. And I, we certainly understand it's not easy. We switched gears many times and that the cost can be high and that starting a business can be intimidating. So we're launching our new law firm with the philosophy that we wanna help small businesses, particularly in the creative arts area, by providing our combined over 60 years of experience in corporate and IP legal work to artists and creators and small business people at a very reasonable cost point. We want to make it easier and more cost effective to get the important intellectual property protections that business need. So with that, we'll get started. And certainly if you have any questions as we go, let me know. So as a new business, it's easy to focus on the obvious tangible startup assets. You know, for a restaurant, for example, it'd be chairs and tables and menus and kitchen setup. But if you do just that, you might be missing out on some significant value. We want you to understand why you should also consider IP in your business plan, intellectual property. Some of the typical things that you might want to protect with intellectual property protections are your ideas, which are inventions or patents, your written or artistic works, which become copyrights, and your brand identity, which is trademark. For trademark and brand protection, you are as a business and how you present yourself can be, who you are as a business and how you present yourself can be a key differentiator. People also start to build connections with the value you add to your brand. So uh, your business may focus on quality. You may have won awards. You may have a really interesting and compelling backstory. So what we're gonna focus on is trademark and brand in our talk today. What is intellectual property or IP? Well, you could joke that IP stands for imaginary property since the actual rights are not things you can touch. If you own a car as a, example of a non-tangible or a, a tangible item, you can drive it for yourself, drive it for others, allow others to drive it, including charging them for some of these things, and prevent others from driving it. The same is true with, for example, a patent. However, unlike a car, a patent doesn't sit in your driveway. Uh, even though it is an, an intangible item though, with a patent, you can still use the invention covered by the patent yourself, allow others to use it, including for money, or, and importantly, you can prevent people who don't have permission from using it. Uh, so you might think, well, gee, why do governments grant this type of exclusive rights to the creators or inventors of intellectual property? I guess there are two good reasons. One, allowing people to have these rights encourages them to develop new and better things, and, and that's good for everyone, progress. It also enables the creators of intellectual property to get investors to help pay for the creation of the intellectual property, and presumably that those investors will benefit financially if it's successful. Uh, so this is huh, a lot on this page. It's an overview of the types of intellectual property that people focus on, especially in the U.S. So we're, we're not going to try and cover each of these IP rights in detail today, but I figure if you attend an IP presentation, you should understand all the IP, at least at some level. But this is a lot. So we're just going to talk a little bit about the big four IP rights. And while it might seem abstract, I'll try to give 
not only a little bit of information about the IP right itself, but also maybe an example to help you feel a little bit more like you can connect with it. First is patents. These protect inventions. Uh, they last for 20 years from filing with the US Patent and Trademark Office. An example of a patent would be that Amazon holds patents on delivery drones. Sort of makes sense, that's what they do. Copyrights, this type of IP protects writings and artistic works. It lasts for the life of the author plus 70 years. And we have the Disney Corporation to thank for that because they kept getting extensions and extensions for Mickey Mouse. Um, as an example, a recent example, um, Marvin Gaye's estate holds the copyright on the song, Let's Get It On. You may have heard that. They recently sued Ed Sheeran, the singer, and lost, claiming that his song, Thinking Out Loud, impermissibly copied Let's Get It On. Now, I read about this trial and about you know, the case, and I think that the fact that Ed Sheeran showed up in court and played guitar and sang may have turned the jury's uh, sentiment a bit, but that's how they came out, that Ed won. Um, a personal example of our own was we were recently in a museum in, in Amsterdam, and somebody was asking the guide, hey, can I take pictures of the paintings? This is a museum with very old paintings, 200, 400 years old. And the guide said, well, it might damage the paintings, so you shouldn't do that. But also, importantly, it would violate the copyright of the creator. So we're glad that the guide was thinking about that. But since these paintings are hundreds of years old, the copyright has almost certainly expired. Um, trademarks, next type of intellectual property. And I mentioned we're gonna focus on that. These protect a distinguishing mark or sign related to a business. A trademark lasts for as long as it is in use and paid up. Um, and there is an exception if something becomes generic. So what does generic mean? So you've probably used something that is by its proper name called cellophane tape, but many people call it scotch tape and scotch was originally a brand. But over time, scotch tape became the name for that type of tape. And so, you know, very few people use cellophane tape, more people use scotch tape. And so it lost its ability to be a unique identifier of a brand. A more recent example, uh, and you may have heard about this, Taco Bell wants to use the phrase Taco Tuesdays in its ads. But there's a restaurant in New Jersey that owns the trademark to Taco Tuesday, Taco John's Restaurants. Now, that's interesting. And I think you'll be seeing some commercials I've been reading about that LeBron James and others are taping to help Taco Bell make the argument that Taco Tuesday has become a generic term and it's not associated with the restaurant in New Jersey. We'll see how that comes out. Then trade secrets, the last one. This might be a lesser known IP right to everyone. Um, trade secrets protect a confidential way of doing something. So uh, you have to have something that's not widely known and you have to continue to hold it as confidential. And this lasts as long as the right, lasts as long as you continue to protect that secret and hold it as confidential. A great example is the formula to Coca-Cola. That might not seem too contemporaneous, but that's been a trade secret since 1891. Uh, and that doesn't mean the formula hasn't changed. That just means whatever version the formula's in, Coca-Cola has kept it close to the vest and a secret. And they've actually famously said only three or four people in the whole corporation have access to that formula. So uh, to focus on trademarks and brands, a brand can be as important to your business as your products. It carries with it the impressions that consumers equate to the quality of your product or service and the trust in your business. Generally, your brand identity takes time and investment to develop, so it is you know, best when it's uniquely yours. Uh, when done correctly, it's a shortcut for consumers to use to make buying decisions, as well as from potential employees who are deciding where they want to work. So just as an example, who would you decide to buy semiconductors from? Fred's Semiconductor Company or Intel Corporation? At least for me, I've heard of Intel Corporation, so I would probably lean towards you know, Intel as a more obvious choice. Uh, in 2022, there were three top global brands. Uh, I would ask for guesses, but I'll just uh, give this one away. I guess the three top global, global brands were, no surprise, Apple, Amazon, and Google. Obvious, right? Um, so who do you think the world's fastest growing brand was in 2022? Well, that was TikTok. Uh, now, I don't know if that's going to continue given all the controversy over TikTok recently, but at least as of 2022, they were the world's fastest growing. And just to um, bring this home a bit, if you look at um, the value, this is sort of an oh wow chart. If 
you look at the value of brand uh, in 2022, um, the top seven brands had hundreds of billions of dollars attributed to the value of their brand. And six of those seven uh, companies were US companies. So while it's unlikely, I guess, although not impossible, that your personal brand or your company's brand will blow up to a valuation of hundreds of billions of dollars in the next few months, it does show that there is real value to be had in branding. And you don't want to leave that out of the equation and down the road realize, ah, I had the opportunity to protect this brand and I didn't do it. And now somebody else is free riding on this value I've created by all the you know good work and hard work I put into uh, creating this brand. So branding is done at three individual, but also at collective levels. That means they sort of stack. Um, so uh, there's an international branding and that might include companies like Amazon and TikTok, but also if you have an Etsy store, your Etsy store is available worldwide. And or there's national or regional branding. Some examples on the chart there, Nationwide and Huntington. They may be national, they may be regional, but the protection is geared not towards international necessarily. There's also local branding, the Roosevelt Coffee House, Land Grant Brewery. Um, we'll talk more about this in a minute, but the point is that even though Wendy's, a, a company that started in Columbus, you know, uh, was once a local or regional company, its scope is now international. And if their brand strategy had been local or regional only, they may have missed out on value. For example, if a Wendy's restaurant started selling hamburgers, in Australia, not the Wendy's that we know from Ohio, but a separate one, when the U.S. Wendy's decided to do business in Australia, they'd very likely face lawsuits or large payments to get the rights to use their name in that country. So it's worth thinking about. Also, this can help to focus branding, you know, building recognition for a brand. The brand, for example, the Roosevelt Coffee House, may not have recognition or favorable impressions in San Francisco. But that may not matter if their business plan is scoped to Columbus or Ohio. All right, so I'm going to try playing some of these sounds. I'm having trouble seeing everyone. So I don't know, Allison, if you wouldn't mind letting me know if people are, if anyone wants to put a guess out there. But I'm going to play a, a sound brand for a couple of companies and uh, be interested if you can guess who they are, if you know who they are. First one. Could you hear that? Yes, I could hear it. Okay, great. Any well, I know you know who it is. Anyone <laughs> anyone else have a guess? <laughs> well, that's Intel. Let me try another one. That's ESPN, I think Monday Night Football, if I'm not mistaken. All right. Oops. Seems to be lost or let me get back to the right one here. Yeah. <laughs> Anyone recognize that? <laughs> oh, I got that one. I got that one. Pillsbury Doughboy. Exactly. Pop and fresh. I, Pillsbury I got Doughboy. One. <laughs> yeah. I got another one that hopefully you'll get. Okay, just a couple more. Yeah, Rena got that one. She said, Let me go. Oh. So THX is the sound system that's used in movie theaters. <laughs> that's the MGM Lion, in case you didn't recognize that. I think this next one, everybody will recognize. They still use Anyone recognize that? <laughs> that's NBC. Oh, Bruce, can you hear? 
Yes, yes. Oh, good, good. Yeah. All right, and just one more. Done. to those, you probably didn't realize just casually that those are sound marks, but they are to evoke a sense of the company that they represent. So for each of those sounds, the ones particularly for the movie companies or the digital you know, sound for THX, for me, when I hear them, it reminds me of sitting in a movie theater with a big thing of popcorn waiting for the movie to begin. And that's what they want. They want to evoke a feeling or a, a re recall or a memory that's a pleasant experience for you. Uh, Bruce remembered or recognized the Pillsbury Doughboy. When I hear that, and I, you have to be of a certain age maybe to remember this, but it reminds me of the sensation of eating a warm buttery crescent roll because that's what they branded. That was one of their key you know, uh, branding strategies was to have you think of those nice crescent rolls. And if it evokes any of those thoughts for you, then it's been successful. Ah, now some colors. You may not have known that that color marks are also protectable and they're also associated with a brand. So over time, some colors have acquired what we attorneys refer to as secondary meaning. They're out there in the marketplace long enough to become uniquely associated with the products they represent. So let's uh, take them, I guess, left to right. Brown color, anyone recognize the brown color? I, I won't let Allison in on this one because she helped me with this. UPS? UPS, that's UPS brown. Yes, you've seen their trucks, right? Anyone recognize the uh, pink in the middle? It's a tougher one. Especially with, well, I'll, I'll help with this one. Especially with the Barbie movie out now, people might go for, that's the Barbie pink, but it's not. That's actually T-Mobile pink. And it's not to be confused with Barbie pink. That's a whole different thing. And then on the right-hand side, uh, if, you're, if you've ever uh, received a very elegant, a uh, gift of jewelry, you might recognize this blue. That's the Tiffany blue. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> we were probably just about to say it. But if you get the whole point of the Tiffany blue is if you get a little box that's in that color from someone, you're supposed to think, oh my gosh, it's a Tiffany, right? And for many people, it does evoke that. So how about yellow? Let me show you one. Cheerios. Do we think this would be a unique color identified with Cheerios. Well, let me show you. There are at least two other cereals with exactly the same color. So although to me, that yellow does evoke Cheerios, it's not distinct enough because there are also other cereals using pretty much the exact same shade of yellow, close enough at least. So another one, <laughs> uh, just for fun. You probably didn't know that scents could be protected as well. Uh, scent marks are very difficult to get. This isn't something everyone can get. And you probably would expect it for things like perfumes, right? Where the scent is the thing. But it does go beyond that. Uh, so I'm going to give you a description. Does this make you think of what? Breads, pastries, baked goods of some sort, right? A scent of sweet, slightly musky vanilla fragrance with slight overtures of cherry combined with a small uh, smell of salt, salted wheat-based dough. Maybe a beer, I don't know, but it, it, it evokes food to me. But it's Play-Doh. So next time you, if you have a child or you're ever near a child with Play-Doh, take off the cap and see if you get that smell. But that is a protected smell, a scent mark. All right, so I guess that was the fun. Now we'll get back to business and Allison's gonna carry the laboring or on the business part, but um, so how do trademarks and branding apply to your business? A trademark is, as I've described, a source identifier. You see a mark, and for example, the one here, Wendy's, which is a local origin, and you think of hamburgers, fries, and my and Allison's favorite, the chicken apple salad, right? But even beyond that, you might start to think about things like their founder, Dave Thomas, who did a lot of work with adoption and championing adoption. So a trademark can carry a lot of meaning. It may be the hamburger, it may be Dave Thomas, but any of those things might bring you in there to buy their product because you have good feelings about that brand. 
On the Wendy's logo you see, you'll see that there's a little R in a circle near Wendy's left pigtail. That means this logo is a federally registered trademark. In other words, it's listed on the US Patent and Trademark Office's register. Why do I bring that up? Well, because you don't necessarily need to register a trademark. You can just start using your brand and mark it with a TM for trademark. This tells others, hey, watch out. I'm using that word or as a uh, source identifier, word or design. So it's a common law or unregistered trademark. It won't be as strong as a registered mark, and we'll get into that shortly, but you may choose to get a registered trademark or not, and that would be a personal decision based on your goals and how important it is to have that protection. So now I'm going to turn things over to my partner, Allison, and I'm gonna see if I can stop sharing. All right. All right, Steve, and I will share my screen. Nope. Oh, I see it. Oh, you did? Okay. Let me try again. All right, perfect. So um, now that you know a little bit about intellectual property with a focus on branding, let's talk about your brand strategy. So first, what is your business going to be? Um, we're all in kind of startup mode here, various stages of startup. Ours is legal services. Um, so some of these examples here, will you run a food truck? Uh, maybe teach yoga? Whatever your business will, will um, be built around. In trademark land, these are called your goods and services. Your trademark, whether it's a logo, like the Wendy's logo that he showed, or simply a word um, just spelled out, it is associated with your goods and services. So David Thomas's company has registered trademarks for the word Wendy's, in addition to that logo that, that you saw with Wendy's picture, uh, for the food industry, and more recently for online gaming and social communities, apps for online ordering, and more. As the business has grown, the Wendy's attorneys file for new registrations. There's also a registered trademark um, for Wendy's, the word Wendy's, to Yun Liang Lin for boots and shoes. So he or she can sell their boots and shoes at the same time as Wendy's uses the same word for their goods and services because they're distinct. Boots, shoes, food, stuff wrapped around food. Um, although Yunlong, uh, Yun Liang Lin would have a problem creating um, online social uh, platforms using the word Wendy's because Wendy's registered it first. The Dave Thomas Wendy's. Anyway, the key here is to consider the ways that you're going to use your brand, your goods and services. That's the first part of your strategy. So next, where will you have your business now and in the future? We'd all like to think our businesses will take off and be wildly successful. And depending on what you do, such expansible expansion may be possible or possibly not. Our business operates in Ohio. We don't offer our services outside of Ohio because there are many rules concerning legal practice and being admitted to practice law in each state. We have a friend uh, who has an Etsy shop under Squirrely Girl Creations. That was the name that she picked, which is a nice little home business that started off making Dungeons and Dragons dice bags. Now that's pretty specialized. But since then, she has expanded to canvas shopping bags and fabric coasters. She's very happy to have a small local business, but is it truly local? Not really, and Steve gave you a preview of this before. Anyone who has web access can buy their, her goods, so she's really in an international business. You'll need to consider the geographic scope of your business when determining how to protect your brand. So that's step number two. On to number three. The most important part of your branding is the name of your business. You're gonna put considerable time, effort, and money into getting it up and running. You want a name that people will remember and associate it with your excellent products and services. So let's talk about distinctiveness. It's the same as how unique your name is compared to other businesses. So if you provide great haircuts, you might choose a more descriptive name like George's Barbershop. People in the community will know, George, hey, he's got that barbershop and he's really great. It's easy to remember. 
If you're opening up a coffee shop, you might choose something a little less descriptive and a little bit more distinct. Bottoms Up Coffee, for example, they're on West Broad Street in Franklinton. Finally, if you want to truly stand out, you might choose a very unique name like Bohindi did. They are a lifestyle experience brand offering intentional jewelry for mindful living, including a bead bar where you can make your own jewelry. I haven't been there yet, but I'd like to try it sometime. I think Bohindi really kind of goes with those types of goods and services. So the more distinctive your name is, the easier it will be to fight off similar confusing names. If you have a business called Georgia's Barbershop and Jenny decides to open up a shop right next door and call hers Jenny's Barbershop, would you be happy about that if you were George? Probably not. And in all likelihood, she would be rather silly to open up right next door, but if she did, what could George do about it? From a legal perspective, George would need to prove that there is a substantial likelihood of confusion in consumers' minds between the two shops. So that substantial likelihood of confusion, I talk to my law students all day long about that when I, I teach over at Ohio State. I don't think Jenny's is very similar to George's, and I think George is going to be out of luck here. So George and Jenny are probably going to peacefully coexist. What about bottoms up versus button up? It's a little closer here. Bottoms up might be able to get button up to switch to a different name with uh, some help of some letter writing. Huh. What about Bohindi versus Bohuman? Well, assuming that they both sell in the mindfulness and jewelry space, so similar goods and services, I think there's a high likelihood that you could look at a Bohuman necklace and think it came from the Bohindi store. Bohindi would likely win that one. Do you always want to be very distinctive? Well, maybe, maybe not. It depends on your goods and services and where your business will operate. So now that you've completed steps one through three, you've got a list of potential names. Before you pick a winner, you need to do some homework. Nobody likes homework, but it's necessary to avoid these unnecessary costs that you see here, including startup costs, possibly needing to rebrand if you run into issues or costs of those darn attorneys. So once you have names in mind, you'll need to see what's already out there in use or registered. Your search will depend on what you're selling and where you're selling it. At a minimum, check the US Patent and Trademark Office, that register of trademarks that uh, we've talked about, do a Google search to see what's out there and check the state of Ohio registered business names. And for a quick note, if you're in a specialized industry like we are, you'll need to be aware of any rules about naming. In the state of Ohio and many other states of we, as we have found out, you can't use the last name of someone who isn't part of a law firm, either past or present. So Steve and I could have named our firm Arch City Law, assuming something confusingly similar isn't out there already, but not Walter's Law, because that would be really confusing. They might think, oh, Bruce uh, started up a law firm and Steve and Allison work for Bruce. So. Again, it's the, it all comes down to um, likelihood of confusion. All right, so your homework is done. You've done your searching and you've got a good, clear name. Should you go to the time and expense of registering it with the US Patent and Trademark Office? Well, as we like, lawyers like to say, the answer to every good question is, it depends. Do you want nationwide protection? Do you want the ability to have the USPTO declare you the winner for that name and thus more easily stop newer businesses that could infringe your trademark? If you're George's Barbershop in German Village, I don't think you should bother. You won't be able to register such a common name with the USPTO and you don't really need nationwide protection. You can rely on other mechanisms called common law. I think you saw that phrase on Steve's charts to stop for example, Georgette from opening her self-named barbershop right over in Marion Village. On the other hand, if you're a software company with a distinctive name like Fizna, I'm assuming I'm pronouncing that correctly, here in Columbus, 
you would be very wise to do a very thorough worldwide search and register in the U.S. and other countries as soon as possible. So if you choose to register your mark, that is handled by the USPTO. And on their site, they have very helpful guides for both beginners and experienced people who deal with trademarks. You'll need to have either actual use or intent to use in commerce. And so in commerce, basically, it's, it's available to the public somehow. So for example, selling your products at a, a, a craft fair would count as being in commerce or posting something on Etsy. So I, I posted my dice bags, my Dungeons and Dragons dice bags on Etsy. That's in commerce. So that's in use. Then the helpful people at the USPTO do what's called examine the application to see if it will be accepted. As long as there isn't something confusingly similar out there already, you should be good to go. But it takes a little while, so plan ahead. If you filed an intent to use application, you have two years to actually use it and then send proof like a screenshot of your web page, for example, um, into the USPTO, and then it will convert from intent to use to actual use. So when your business becomes a roaring success, then it's a matter of periodically demonstrating continued use along with renewal fees, because nothing's free with the government. Recall from Steve's chart of the major types of IP, your trademark will last as long as it is in active use. So we've talked about branding a lot today, but taking a step back to IP generally, managing your intellectual property is all about managing risk. We all know being in business carries with it a certain amount of risk. Let's try to minimize the risk associated with either infringing somebody else's IP or failing to protect your own IP. With branding, it's mostly about being aware of what is already out there so you don't end up running into issues with a competing or confusingly similar brand. Other types of IPs carry the same risk. Copyright battles over songs, use of technology that already has been patented by someone else, and more. If you fail to properly protect your own IP, original works, ideas, secrets, you expose yourself to these risks listed on this chart. Is anyone a Shark Tank fan? I am. Steve, not so much, but I can occasionally talk him into watching it with me. So from Shark Tank, Mark Cuban always asks if the entrepreneur has filed a patent because it gives a better ability to license or stop others who are taking your technology and using it or selling it, and thus adds value. And speaking of value, these are some of the many ways we can add value and help our clients to protect and manage their intellectual property. It can get complicated very quickly and we can help sort things out. Our focus is to enable you to do what's comfortable for yourself and we can assist with the rest at a cost effective rate. And finally, if you get a letter concerning any of these topics that you see here, please talk to an attorney first. It doesn't have to be us, but just go talk to an attorney. All right, so thank you all for joining us today. And thank you to Bruce for helping us to get started and inviting us to speak. Steve and I both teach at Ohio State's Law School, so it's really nice to talk about some more practical aspects of the law and help out the community. Now, I'm sure you're all diligently and thoughtfully reading our About Us material <laughs> as you think about eating dinner. So who has a question? Uh, nothing in chat. Uh, if any of our guests have questions, feel free to uh, take yourself off mute and pose that question. Right. Um, while they're thinking about that, I do have a couple of questions I'm hoping you can um, uh, address. Um, the first is, um, we hear often um, this idea about a poor man's copyright. <clears throat> um, can you talk about what that is and whether or not that is actually an option? You know, that's, in, oh, go, go ahead, Steve. No, I was going to say, I think, I'm thinking that might be the fact that copyrights don't need to be registered to be valid. Um, and that's true. 
And really the only typical reason why you would register a copyright is if you were anticipating litigation. Uh, we worked for corporations and sometimes they would take very valuable uh, intellectual property and get a registered copyright for that because they wanted to proactively be ready if they, there was ever litigation. But there are other effective ways of handling, establishing when you've created something uh, that don't require litigation, even as simple as the old, the old, old days where if you wrote a book, put that book in the mail and mail it to yourself, then you would have a postmark stamp on a copy of that so you could prove you had created it by that date. Don't open it up, of course, but leave it in that postmarked envelope. That's kind of old school, but that's just showing the idea of there are other ways to accomplish it than getting a registered trademark, which can be expensive, or registered copyright, I'm sorry, which can be expensive. Yeah, in, in this digital era, there's all kinds of ways yes. of proving when things are created, the dates that things were posted to box, uh, whatever. Uh, in reality, copyright happens as soon as you you your original creation is complete and, and written on paper or recorded on a movie camera or in a painting. All right, thank you. Um, how about a provisional patent? Um, how does that differ from um, a, a standard patent? I'll take that one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so when you uh, decide that you've got um, an idea that you want to file a patent to protect, then you have there there are requirements that you have to write down. You have to describe it in enough detail so that someone else could um, duplicate what you've done, and then you send off your application to the USPTO, and there's an examination process, just like trademarks, um, and you can, instead of going straight at, straight to that um, full-blown process of heading down the, the pathway to a, a patent, hopefully, at the end of that process, you can file a provisional patent, which um, doesn't have to be totally fully fleshed out in terms of certain parts of it. You have to put the, the description in it. But the other parts, like claims, don't have to be fully fleshed out when you file a provisional patent application. And it's sort of a placeholder, and it can last for a year until you want to file the full patent application. So if you're like, eh, you know, let's let's throw some money at a provisional patent application until I decide, see what happens in the next year, some people do that. Okay. Um, and then what, what is right of first use? Right of first use. I'm not sure I know what that refers um, to. Okay. Um, it is a, um, as far as I understand, we have clients who frequently will be looking for an opportunity or a way to avoid filing a, any kind of intellectual um, property filings with the um, U.S. Patent and Trademark Office because of expense. And they'll argue that I'm the first person to use this, so by law, this is mine. I don't know that that's true or not, but... Yeah, so um, you can't find you can't get a patent if somebody else has already sold it or basically made use of it in public, and so um, and then there are certain very limited circumstances where if you've got prior use before somebody else goes out and protects their IP and you can prove it, then you could avoid getting into a um, paying a bunch of money, but there are very specific conditions that you have to satisfy. Right. Thank you. Um, can you talk a bit about um, the processes for these various filings? I didn't know there's no one um, filing, there's multiple options. Um, what, does, what does this entail? So if I'm a new business owner and I really think that um, my brand has some uh, momentum here in Central Ohio. I'm about to start selling on a website rather than just at craft fairs. Um, what, what would you suggest I um, consider doing at that point? So in most cases, intellectual property, you know, you can, in theory, file it yourself. You don't have to have a lawyer to do it. Um, it can be specialized. And sometimes the agents at the different agencies are more or less willing or able to help. Uh, for example, U.S. Patent and Trademark Office is quite overburdened. Uh, so, you know, you can go there and say, I'm going to do this on my own without a lawyer. 
and it's possible to get started on it. You might miss things. They might be able to help you with some of those things. Um, it's you know definitely possible, and I've definitely heard of examples of people doing it. Uh, it's a longer process. You're you have to really have a lot of time to spend to do it, uh, and so you know that it's not impossible. Um, for copyright, as we talked about, you know uh, you don't really have to file uh, with a copyright, and there's not a whole lot of compelling reasons to do it. Um, that's a different agency. That's not uh, the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. That's actually uh, controlled by the uh, the same people who control the libraries, uh, Library of Congress, which is a little bit uh, un unusual and unexpected. Um, am I missing anything in that, Allison? I... No, I mean, the, the big thing is filing for, uh, is really getting the naming and the branding right. That is the most important thing when you're starting out on, on a business because there are countless stories of, well, for example, there's there was a food truck here um, called the, um, I got to get this right. Um, it was the Wicked Lobster yeah. truck, food truck. And there was a food truck out in California who had registered their mark, same mark, and the local truck didn't know about it. And so the local truck got a nice little letter in the mail. Hey, you're using our name. You need to stop. And ultimately, the um, the Wicked Lobster decided that it was more cost effective to rebrand their business to the Naughty Lobster <laughs> um, rather than fight the registered mark from out in California. And so, I mean... Food trucks, come on, they're they're really local. Who would think that you would run into such an issue? But they did, and they ended up having to go through the cost of rebranding, and it was a balancing test. Do I pay the lawyers? Do I do I just rebrand? Right. Um, so that's the most important one. If you if you're writing an app, like a software, or you you want to write apps, I might consider getting that registered, um, just for for proof, um. And then patents, unless you're really like in the tech business and, and what you are, are selling is something really, really new and unique. I mean, if it is, yeah, go out there and try to get that protected. Um, but if it's not, then I wouldn't worry about patents. I will say Allison's example, and there have been a number of other even very local examples of companies who have started up uh, with a name and had to pull back spending a whole lot of money to rebrand. Uh, that's something that if you read the local press, comes up quite a lot. There was a big fight with Fox's Bagels and the North Market with whether they Blocks, had, right? yeah. yeah, Blocks Bagels, uh, switched to Fox's Bagels because they, you know, had started with the licensing deal they thought and it didn't turn out they had the right to use the name. And so, you know, rebranding is a big deal. You've got a lot of customers who, are used to hearing a name and you start using a different name and, and they think, you know, has it been sold? Is the value different now? Am I going to get the same product? And so it's, you know, that's an example of, I think I mentioned early on, it's a lot better to think ahead on these items than to sort of blunder your way through it. And again, that's the difference between possibly having a lawyer help you or not. Uh, and I'm not just saying this because of <laughs> we're lawyers, you know, there can be a lot of value having somebody guide you through the process who knows what they're doing. Sort of like why we went to Bruce to help us with setting up a business. Somebody who's been through it before and knows the path is always very helpful. This is um, incredibly valuable information. And I say that because very often, um, and I've, I've done this myself, you know, establishing a new brand, it's um, internally generated. Oh, I think my idea is clever. I like this name. Isn't that cute? I love what this means to me. And we become so emotionally um, bonded with that concept that then we run with it and we don't do, just like you said, we may check the Secretary of State's rosters to see if this business name has been registered, but we don't think beyond that. Um, <clears throat> and we have a, a client who was recently served a cease and desist letter from uh, your friends and mine at Travelers Insurance, mm. because they argued that her logo was too similar to their umbrella. So oh. this was really important because she had actually paid a graphic designer to conduct that research and to draft design that logo for her. 
and now she can't use it. And she also can't find that person to hold them liable for helping her, you know, creating that brand for her. So now, as you said earlier, you know, she's now responsible for, do I determine, you know, do I fight with travelers? You know, they're a national company. She has a small local business. So, but they are so determined to protect their brand that they're coming for her. So, yeah. you know, as you said, she's like, it's easier for me just to rebrand. And there is so much involved in that. So um, well, I'm, I'm glad you guys are talking about this. It's so important to really understand what your brand means right. to your target market. You know, it's a collateral item, just like, you know, your vision, your mission and core values and all of these other things. Um, and one of the interesting things too, is I think you can so convince yourself that it's distinctive or different. And the test is really consumers. And they do surveys of consumers to say, do you think these two things are different or the same? You know, if you see this name, do you believe that it comes from this origin? And so a lot of times you're able to convince yourself, oh no, people would distinguish it, but getting a third party perspective that's not as quite as wedded to something you've fallen in love with can be very helpful because it's very hard if you really love the brand and you really love the design and you spent money on it, it's very hard for you to be objective when you're trying to answer the question of, are these really distinctive and would there be confusion? You're probably not the right person to ask because <laughs> you really want a particular answer and that's normal. Right, and we're, we're constantly taking in information. So we may subconsciously have registered this design concept in our, in our heads and we've taken it from someplace else and it's very easy to, um, regurgitate that as our own brand. You know, so, oh, I like this color palette. I like this design. Never recognizing, oh, I saw this five years ago when I was in the Bahamas. Oh, it is somebody else's brand. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Having the opportunity to do that research and make sure that it is truly unique is um, you know, priceless. You know, you're establishing a brand on that. So, And we actually, Alice and I talk about this all the time with music because so many artists are being sued by other artists for you know, taking their music. And, you know, music is difficult. There are only so many chords and so many ways of expressing music. And so, you know, you could imagine at some point in time, it would be almost impossible to create a completely unique, you know, artistic creation in music. Uh, and so you see a lot of suits around that and a lot of people arguing fair use, which is a whole nother thing, uh, but that they're, they're doing it in such a way that it is permissible. I remember when I was in, uh, high school, I'm dating myself. It was um, Vanilla Ice and Queen. It was a certain yeah. beat pattern that somebody asserted, ah, this is ours. And you know. right. <laughs> um, so since you brought it up here, can you talk about fair use? What exactly is that? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I got this one because right. I, I spend, oh, probably a good three classes on fair use when I, I teach my uh, introduction to intellectual property class. So do you bring up Andy Warhol? Um, I closely oh, yeah. followed the Andy Warhol case that just was decided by the Supreme Court, and I will be incorporating that into my class this fall. <laughs> yeah. Because you're nothing if not current. Right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So. Um, in order to be, um, so there's some thresholds to, to have copyright. It's got to be original and um, it's got to be fixed. And it, when something is, um, then there are, so then you've got your copyright. But there's exceptions to copyright protection and fair use means under certain circumstances and there's a four part test for whether it's fair use or not, then you can avoid in, um, the charge of infringement. And fair use goes to, is it, um, is it a parody? Um, certain songs parody others. Um, I, again, I'm probably dating myself, but there's a Pretty Woman by Roy Orbison and then Two Live Crew did a parody of it. And um, Roy Orbison wasn't very happy about this, um, but he lost because it was it was found to be a parody. Um, if it's for purpose of news or commentary, um, and in the Andy Warhol case, if it's um, they tried to argue that Andy Warhol's um, rendering of a portrait of Prince that was originally very very it was very very similar to original photograph taken by a, a, a photographer. And then Warhol did his treatment with the you know the four different pictures of, with colors. Um, he tried to argue that it was transformative. It the original picture was different, 
and he took it and transformed it for a different uh, expression. Well, he lost that argument because they were pretty darn close. <laughs> they were pretty close. Um, so, for example, if you take um, Google, Google, boy, I'm really getting into the, the weeds here for, for my law school, <laughs> but um, Google, they, they um, take like thumbnail images of people's um, photographs. Um, they used to a while ago. Um, you could look up an image and then you'd, you'd see thumbnails. And so they've, they're copying the originals, but they have it in little thumbnail size. So they have transformed the original work, maybe a full page into like a little tiny thumbnail that is not same quality, but it's used for search engine purposes. And it ultimately directs the user back to the original website. That's fair use transforms into different purpose and character of the use. It also goes to, are you making commercial use of it? Are you using it for education? We professors get away with a fair amount because we can use things for educational purposes. Um, is it taking away from the market of the original um, item or not? So it's a four part test that involves a fair amount of analysis and it just depends on the court. So and it's I, not really a, a something that you want to rely on, that you, you find something, oh, that's cool, I want to use it, ah, fair use. Well, it's notoriously unreliable when it comes to court challenges. I'll stop there. That I was, was like, I'm just going to say that the Supreme Court's decision is pretty controversial and not a, many people don't agree. And if you read the dissent, not that you would, because that's a lot of heavy legal stuff. I think the dissent had the better argument. So uh, if you're trying to predict what fair use is, the only reason I bring that up is if the Supreme Court justices can't agree, and it was a very hotly contested case, and many people felt it was decided wrong, then to try and guess and say, oh, I'm, I'm the, clearly what I'm doing is fair use, I would advise against that because it's really hard to predict what's going to be you know, determined to be fair use. And in the days of AI where content, everyone wants all this content, to beef up their AI, um, you know, there are all these AI creators who want to use everything and say that anything I bring in is fair use. And all the content creators are saying, wait a minute, you've basically made it so I can't make any money off of anything I do. And so you can see how the two camps set up uh, on that. I better right. pull your pants off of me. Oh, yeah, sorry, that's a <laughs> lot of information. And, and we have access to everything with ye old internet. So naturally, yeah. yeah. So just because the the individual claims fair use doesn't mean it is going to be determined to be fair use. So. Correct. Um, right. Which is interesting because our you know throughout history has a a tradition of appropriating uh, works by others in one way or another. So yes. what does this open the door for? You know, from your 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 Andy Warhols, your Lichtensteins to you know, anyone else. So interesting. Um, so we've got six minutes here. Um, I do want to be respectful of your time um, and give our um, um, guests here a time to our um, attendees client, an opportunity to ask questions if they have any. Um, if I've posted anything here in chat. Um, so with that, um, thank you for being here. I really appreciate it. This has been really informative. Um, in the time I've spent working with small businesses, I've never had this information this much information, concise, clearly expressed information about intellectual property. So thank you for taking time to do this. Um, and if you're watching this video either live or um, on our YouTube channel and you would like um, Allison and Steve's contact information, please don't hesitate to reach out to me, bwalters at cscc.edu and I will share their contact information with you. Um, and with that, if there are no other questions here, um, I think we've got five minutes back for our evening. We can go get that early dinner you were talking about. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great evening. Yeah.